Blake Snell is your 2023 NL Cy Young Award winner, and after a rough first month of the year, he helped put things together and have a dominant six, seven month stretch in the season. And although the Padres didn't make the playoffs, his contributions helped lead them to get close enough to a wild card spot that they're tasting at the last couple days and makes him in line for a massive payday come this offseason as he's currently a free agent. This is Snell's second Cy Young Award. He won back in 2018 with the Tampa Bay Rays, and he becomes one of the few pitchers who won a Cy Young Award in both the American and National Leagues. After putting together such a stellar performance in 2023, it's interesting to see how the trade that sent Blake Snell from Tampa Bay to San Diego has developed. It's been a couple years this trade happened just before 2021 hit, so it's been a little bit of time for the prospect the Rays got in return to go ahead, develop, make their major league debuts, and see exactly what happened in their careers. Although not everyone has made their debut yet, there is still a lot of intrigue as to what exactly they got because the Rays traded away a former Cy Young winner and now a current Cy Young winner. So you gotta hope that their return was big and knowing the Rays, which you can see in the video above that I already made, they're pretty good at making trades where they trade away their players and getting prospects. You'll note that I didn't talk a ton about this trade in that video, half because I knew I was going to make this video at some point soon, and the other half you'll see by the time we get to the end of the video. With all his accolades and now heading into free agency, now is the best time to go ahead and look in a little bit of hindsight and see exactly what the Tampa Bay Rays got for Blake Snell services and see how that trade has panned out for both sides. Before we go on, you know the drill. If you could hit that baseball in the bottom right corner or that baseball if you're on TV by hitting the down arrow to get to my channel and hit the subscribe button, it would really mean a lot and help my channel grow. I want to reach a thousand subscribers soon and that would be a big help. You also get more baseball content not only from me, but from other awesome creators out there. Without further ado, let's dive into the Blake Snell trade and see exactly where these teams have ended up, and let's start with the man himself, Blake Snell. Blake Snell had a really interesting 2023 campaign. He struggled out of the gate in his first five starts and really looked a little bit lost, and it seemed like he was going to ruin the payday he was going to get at the end of the year, but he quickly put things together, and being able to do that allowed him to go ahead and put together a stellar campaign that eventually won him the Cy Young Award. Although he pulled away at the end of the year and asserted himself as by far the best pitcher in the National League, some of his underlying stats kind of raised some confusion and caused a lot of debate, especially heading into the end of the season, as to whether he really deserved it. He definitely proved that he did, but that debate still stands, and when you look at his stats, there's still some questions about how in the world this guy was so good. For those not super sabermetrically inclined, his numbers look pretty good. 14-9, a 225 ERA. An ERA plus of 182, which led the National League, and a league low 5.8 hits per 9 innings. Think looked really good with 234 strikeouts about as well. He was a dominant pitcher. But then you can kind of start looking into some of the underlying stats and some of the advanced stats, which kind of throw things off a little bit. He had 99 walks on the year, which is staggering, and it led the major leagues. I mean, no starting pitcher came really that close. It goes to show that his stuff just overcame his control issues, and that's just part of it. He had 13 wild pitches on the year, which is kind of staggering. So, you know, that's just part of his game. He doesn't have a ton of control, but with stuff like his, he is electric and that helps him get out of a lot of jams. His FIP or fielding independent pitching was 3.44, which is certainly respectable. He's had better numbers in his career. His 2018 Cy Young campaign was below three and so was 2022, but 3.44 is certainly not a bad standard and actually is identical to what his career stats have been in terms of FIP. And then you get to Sierra, which is a little bit more sabermetric way of looking at a pitching performance, and it was below average at a 4.06. So he really had a lot of variation if you look at some of the sabermetric stats versus what his actual performance was, and I'm a firm believer that Cy Young should be an actual performance award, and sabermetric data has its uses, and it's incredibly important, and I think that more and more people, especially in the baseball world, should get away from things like pitcher wins and batting average and runs batted in and into more sabermetric stats and that takes a whole lot of work to do but for a Cy Young award those things like ERA like runs batted in like home runs and all those other stats do play a lot into it and you have to consider those when you're looking at a single season performance yes things like expected fielding independent pitching or expected ERA are important when you're looking at a player's overall career or whether they should get paid or whether your team should sign them. But what really matters for an award like the Cy Young or the MVP or Rookie of the Year is what you did on the field, what actually happened when the games are played. That's why we play them. So for someone like Blake Snell, it makes total sense to give him the Cy Young Award, even though some of the things like Sierra don't necessarily suggest he was a great pitcher in 2023. His results proved it, and that's sometimes all you need to be a dominant pitcher. So now let's talk about the players that the Rays end up getting back and the biggest name with the number 27 prospect in all of baseball according to MLB Pipeline, that was Luis Patino. 
Patino signed with the Padres in the 2016-17 international signing class where they spent a ton of money and he signed for $130,000 which is by no means big name money but it's a lot more than a lot of other international signing prospects end up getting and that's just kind of how things go. Thankfully for the Padres, it seemed like at the time he really broke out and that money was well worth the investment. He really showed a lot of promise in his first full season at age 18 and his age 19 season in 2019. He broke out across 94 and two-thirds inning between Class A and Double A. He pitched to a 2.57 ERA with 123 strikeouts. I say it all the time on this channel, but the jump from single A or high A to double A is the hardest in all of the minor leagues, only rivaled by the jump from triple A to the major leagues. The fact he was able to do that at age 19, five years younger than a lot of the people he's playing against, is just incredibly impressive, and that helped lead him to a major league debut in the shortened 2020 season out of San Diego's bullpen at only age 20. After making that appearance, of course, he got shipped out to Tampa Bay, and there was a lot to be excited about his prospect profile. That is part of the reason why he was a 27th ranked prospect, pitched in a high leverage role when Team World played Team USA in the Futures game when they broke it up that way. Patino was a hot topic prospect, and a lot of people had him as a top 10 pitching prospect in all of baseball, if not top 5, if not your favorite pitching prospect. There was a lot of variability in that 2020 class, especially as COVID started to hit, especially as the season ended up getting canceled the minor leagues. Patino showed a lot of potential, and people were excited about what he could do. His best pitch has to be his fastball, and that really developed while he was in the minor leagues. He was only 150 pounds when he got signed, so that bulking and strength that the Padres system put him in helped get up to 99 miles an hour and really be a solid, consistent mid-90s fastball that has some really good late life to it. That late life, which has a little bit of a cutting action to it and doesn't really seem to take away too much from the velocity they can get on it, pairs really well with his other plus pitch, which is his slider. They break in the same direction and it has a lot of break and can miss a lot of bats and has all throughout his minor league career. He has a solid curveball, a solid changeup, but his calling card has always been his control. In the minor leagues, he never walked a lot of guys and that really helped him blossom into a solid player and a top prospect, which is why the Rays wanted him so badly. You can see that he hasn't really done well by looking at the stats on the screen during his time in Tampa Bay, pitching to a 509 ERA, a FIP of 523, and walking 42 batters across 97 and a third innings. He just really didn't put things together as Tampa Bay had hoped. And it's really disappointing because he has a lot of exciting stuff. And I mean, you could watch it in the video now. He was an elite prospect and you could see exactly why. Unfortunately for him, he really has fallen off his pedigree. I believe he's currently out of minor league options. And that's part of the reason why the Rays decided to trade him to the Chicago White Sox at this trade deadline to clear a 40-man space, and now he's pitching in Chicago, which is a good thing because they're rebuilding, but he hasn't really put a lot of things together there. He's a 3.57 ERA across 17 and two-thirds innings pitched, but it's really been that lack of control that's gotten him. His calling card in the minor leagues has not translated to the major leagues, so if he can put that together, there's a lot of potential. He's only 24 right now, so there's a chance he can do it. He's still very young, and Chicago has the time to do it, so I wouldn't be shocked to see Luis Patino come back and be a very solid major league player if he can get those control issues all fixed and figured out. The other big player who was acquired in this deal was someone who had just exhausted their prospect eligibility right before this deal went down, and that was Francisco Mejia, a catcher who the Rays were really hoping was going to be their catcher of the future and pair really well with Mike Zizino for the coming years as they go ahead and chase a postseason run. He was originally signed by Cleveland back in 2012 and ended up coming over to the San Diego Padres in 2018 in the trade that sent Brad Hand and Adam Simber at the trade deadline to, at that time, the Indians and now the Guardians. Mejia's prospect hype really broke out in 2016 where he authorized a 50-game hitting streak the longest in the minor leagues since 1963 and finished 6th in all the minor leagues in batting average. He built upon that success the following year, winning Rookie of the Year honors in AA, and ended up getting called up at age 21 by the end of the year. That success continued with San Diego, and he ended up being the 26th ranked prospect at the end of the 2019 season, according to MLB Pipeline, so hopes were really high for him in his future. He was a switch hitting catcher, which, as you could probably guess, had a really good hit tool and good hits for some power as well. His biggest trait, though, was his cannon behind the plate and the fact that he had the ability to hit for average and throw runners out was huge. He had an elite arm, and that's not putting something lightly or just saying all catchers have elite arms. Even for a catcher, his arm was stellar. Although his pitch framing never really came to fruition, even in the major leagues, and he was kind of short at 5'8", 188, that's just part of his frame, that's part of who he is, and he had the defensive ability to be a solid defender and could hit for average, so he was a really exciting prospect, and if his defense ever caught up, he was going to be a wonderful player in the major leagues.
There was some talk in his minor league career of moving around simply because his framing ability wasn't great. They tried him in the outfield. They tried him at third base, and he never really stuck, and it seemed like catcher was kind of exactly where he was going to stick. And he's not a bad defender per se, but it definitely was never his calling card in the minor leagues. And if you could find a position where you could have a good defensive catcher, move someone who has the potential to be a solid hitter to a less defensively intense position, you go ahead and make that move. He was Tampa Bay's primary catcher in 2021 and 2022, and he didn't put up stellar numbers in either of those years. He was Tampa Bay's primary catcher from 2021 to 2022, put up pretty mediocre numbers at the plate, a 251 batting average, 292 on base, 397 slugging, OPS plus just south of 100, so he's below league average hitting, which really doesn't cut it for a guy who is meant to be more of an offensive catcher and a guy whose bat you could rely on, maybe in the four, the five, the six slot in the lineup, and he had never lived up to that hype in 2021 or 2022. I brought up his defensive struggles because that was something that he was never really good at. He didn't do defense in the major leagues across 21 or 22. I mean, he was a fine pitch framer, and again, his arm helped him out a lot in recovering some of those defensive metrics, but he wasn't going to go and frame a pitch from a ball to a strike and convince an umpire to, you know, call a strike three that wasn't really a strike. And that hindered his ability to stay on the base pass and is why it took a little bit longer for him to really cement himself as a solid catcher and someone the Rays could rely on when they're trying to make a push for a World Series crown, which didn't end up happening. 2023 was a make it or break it year for Mejia and unfortunately he didn't put together. Across 50 games, his strikeout rate was nearly 25%. His batting average was barely above 225. His on base percentage was barely above 250. He really wasn't walking a lot. He wasn't hitting for average. He wasn't hitting for a ton of power. Five home runs is not great. For a guy who doesn't have a ton of power, it's fine. But if he's not backing that up with some more hitting or some more walks, it just doesn't make sense to go ahead and keep him. An 80 OPS plus player for a guy who's supposed to be a minus defender plus offensive catcher. And the Rays DFA'd him in August to make up some roster space on their 40-man roster. He's currently a free agent, DFA'd again back in August, and now a free agent for the first time. He'll likely sign a minor league contract somewhere, but he's not going to be someone that's going to make a huge difference at the major league level, which is pretty unfortunate. I was very excited for him as a prospect. I thought he was going to be a solid player, and unfortunately for him, and unfortunately for the Rays, it just did not turn out in their favor. The last two players in this deal haven't been called up to the major leagues yet, so there's a little bit of time to see exactly how this is going to pan out, but for the next player, Blake Hunt, it won't be for the Tampa Bay Rays. The 69th overall pick in the 2017 draft by the Padres, Blake Hunt was a slow developing catcher who everyone knew was going to take a little bit of time coming out of high school. Catching is a very defensively tough position, physically demanding, and it a lot of times does take some time for a catcher to develop their chops. And it is sometimes common to see players go ahead and shoot through the high school ranks. Right now, you're seeing players like Cole Emerson potentially make a big jump this year after being drafted out of high school. But for catchers, it's a lot more difficult simply because of the defensive demands of the position and how physically demanding they are. And for Blake Hunt, it makes sense that he was going to take a little bit of time to develop. I'm sure his $1.6 million signing bonus didn't hurt his ability to feel good about taking a little bit of time, but... Everyone knew it was going to be a little bit of a stretch for him to go ahead and make the major leagues in a rush, and his defense ability was really what his calling card was, not his offense. So he had to develop that and ensure he would be a solid catcher going forward because his bat really wasn't going to be what was going to carry him through the minor leagues and make a major league debut. His arm was a little bit weaker than Mejia's. Mejia had an elite arm. I think Blank Hunt has a plus arm. I think you'd see most scouting departments agree with that as well. It's a solid arm, nothing to write home about, but it was decent enough, and his framing was definitely a plus-plus skill. He was able to go ahead and be a much better defensive catcher than Mejia ever could be. No offense to Francisco Mejia if you ever watched this video, but that's just more of his profile. He was never going to be a bat-first guy. He could frame pitches a little bit better, and that was why teams were excited about him. Think of if you're super invested into the draft in 2023. The Kansas City Royals had the option of selecting either Blake Mitchell, a high school left-handed catcher who was known for his defensive ability, or a proven college superstar in Kyle Teal, a catcher out of Virginia, and they opted to go the more defensively-minded high school route, so there definitely is some value in being a defensive catcher. I already talked about it with Mejia. Defense in a catcher and repertoire with a pitcher and the ability to frame are very important and can make or break a game. So having that ability is a plus skill. It provides a lot more value for catcher than it does for almost every other position, save for maybe the combination of shortstop and center field. So far, the Rays put a lot of effort into refining his swing. He hit 12 home runs this year compared to in 2022, 5. And although the numbers in his batting don't really reflect that he's made a huge jump, 
He's got a 331 on base percentage, a 256 average, nothing super spectacular. His OPS did jump up to 815 compared to 678 the previous year. So there is definitely some improvement to his hitting and the Rays did a pretty good job with going ahead and trying to develop him a little bit more offensively. So if you watch the Rays video, which I hope you have, you'll know that the Rays are great at going and getting prospects and trading them away when they're about to break the 40-man roster and they don't have space for them and getting a player who will just be a superstar in the future. And unfortunately, that was what happened to Blake Hunt literally a week ago. He ended up getting traded to the Seattle Mariners for the Mariners' 8th round pick in the 2022 draft simply because Hunt had reached the time where he could declare himself a minor league free agent and sign anywhere. So the Mariners traded for him and added them to his 40-man roster. So now he's guaranteed to be a Seattle Mariner going into 2024. And although he probably won't reach the major league roster, he definitely has the ability to be an impact catcher defensively and maybe even offensively in the near future for a Seattle team looking to make the playoffs. The final player left in the seal is someone that has a huge potential to be an impact player for the Rays going forward, and that's Cole Wilcox, a right-handed pitcher who's currently pitching in AA for the Montgomery Biscuits and might end up starting the season in AAA if the Rays feel like he's ready. I personally don't think so, but decide for yourself when I go ahead and talk about his future and what he's done so far in the minor leagues. He was the third round pick of the Padres in the shortened 2020 draft and signed for a third round record $3.3 million out of the University of Georgia because a lot of people figured he would go back to school. He was a highly touted prospect coming out of high school and was expected to be a highly ranked prospect going into the 2020 draft if it stayed normal and would probably get a very big signing bonus should he go out in 2021. But $3.3 million is a hard number to turn down and that's why the Padres decided to sign him for so much money. He hadn't even pitched an inning for the Padres minor league system before the race said we want him and he was part of the package that got Blake Snell into the Padres uniforms. He got off to a remarkable start his first season and 10 games started at single A. He pitched to a 1-0 record with a 2-0-3 RA across 44 and a third innings pitched with 52 strikeouts and only 5 walks for a whip of 0.86. Those are just some incredible numbers, and although he was a little bit old for the class, it was really, really exciting, and unfortunately, in that 10th start, he got an injury that ended up having to get Tommy John surgery, but he made a pretty speedy recovery, which was very enticing for the Tampa Bay Rays, and goes to show that you know there was a lot of rebound and work with this kid, and they were really excited about his future based on his ability in 2021. And the fact he put together a solid campaign coming back from injury in 2022, it wasn't outstanding, a 3.94 ERA, but he struck out 24 guys in 16 innings pitch, only walking four while making the jump to double A, so definitely nothing to scoff at. He finally got his first full season in 2023, pitching exclusively in double A, and his numbers took a little bit of a hit. Across 106 and two thirds innings pitched, he had 99 strikeouts, which is a little bit lower than what he had done previously. He walked 44 guys, which is a big jump as well. So it just seems like he needed a little bit more time to go and develop and really dominate double A before I'd be comfortable personally myself moving him up to triple A and making the jump. Yes, he is 24 right now. He'll be 25 by midseason next year. So the clock is ticking a little bit, but there's definitely a lot of time for him to go ahead and make his debut in the major leagues and make the jump to triple A. He does not be protected by the 40 man roster rule this year to be protected from the rule five draft. So he'll be fine. He will have to be next year though. So the race have plenty of time to go ahead and make a decision and they don't have a ton of 40-man space, but he's a guy that has enough upside that you're going to want to make him protected and potentially be a bullpen guy, low leverage, going into the playoffs next year should they be fortunate enough to make it in a very competitive AL East. Pitch-wise, he has a really good sinking fastball, which is a plus-plus pitch. His slider is also plus-plus. It has a lot of good break. And for a decent portion of the tunnel, they look pretty similar and they break in completely opposite directions, which is awesome. And he's a solid third pitch and a changeup. It's nothing to write home about, but it's a good enough pitch. Control's about average too, so if being a starter doesn't work out, I wouldn't be shocked to see him end up in a medium leverage role of the bullpen. I don't think he'll be a high leverage guy. He just doesn't have that great breakout pitch. His fastball and slider are both really good, but I just don't see it as a dominant pitch that can go and win a save situation or hold situation. He'll be a good player regardless, and I think with a little bit more development and a little bit more time recovering from Tommy John, he'll be a very solid player going forward and someone the Rays should be very excited about in their future. I think it's fair to say right now that with Cole Wilsox being the 11th ranked prospect in the Rays system and no one else being even in the organization, that the San Diego Padres definitely won this trade. There's no doubt about that in my mind. To get a Cy Young Award winner is huge, and to get him for a bunch of guys who weren't going to pan out anyways is a big, big win. That's, again, part of the reason why I didn't include this trade in my Tampa Bay Rays trade video, because it kind of goes against the grain. 
I didn't mention it because it wouldn't be a fair video if I didn't at least talk about it, but this trade definitely did not work in the Rays' favor. I think there's a lot of potential in the guys they got, and sometimes you just end up missing, and maybe the guy that Blake Hunt got traded for ends up turning to be someone great, and without that deal, the Rays wouldn't have gotten him, and you never know what's going to happen. There's always a lot of moving pieces in a trade tree, but for the most part, I think anyone could say that without a doubt, Blake Snell is the best player in the seal, will be the best player in the seal, and beats the combined efforts of all four players that the Rays got in this deal. Maybe Cole Wilcox will have a breakout year, become a Cy Young Award winner, but chances aren't that great, and I have a feeling that Blake Snell is just going to be the best player in the deal, and the Rays might regret not trading him to a different team elsewhere after they made that historic World Series run in the shortened 2020 season. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate your guys' support. There'll be two videos here on the screen. Go ahead and click one of them if you're interested in watching more, and that baseball will be right there in the middle for you to click and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you in the next video.